Today we're talking share power with Merrin Somerset Webb. That's the title of her new book. I'm Ian Martin, editor of Reaction and Share Power, subtitled How Ordinary People Can Change the Way That Capitalism Works and Make Money Too, is a fascinating book. Welcome, Merrin. Um, Thank you. First question, really, just what, what's the problem here that you're diagnosing? What's not working in the system? Well, the problem here is a matter of, of ownership, who owns what and what it means to own something. And the core wonderful thing, because you, there's something wonderful that, that is causing the problem, is that in the UK at the moment, and in fact across much of the world, almost all of us, particularly if we are in work, are shareholders. So in the UK, we have an auto-enrollment pension system, which is absolutely amazing. And it's got to the point where around 75% of the people in work have an auto-enrolled pension. And that means that they own equity, that they are shareholders, that via that pension they own a little bit of lots of different companies. And it's not just that, of course, there are many, many other shareholders via different routes in the UK and there are lots of people with SIPs, with self-invested personal pensions, lots of people with pensions pre-auto-enrollment, and of course going on three million people with stocks and shares, ISAs, and then outside that you've got, of course, many other shareholders. So millions and millions and millions of us, the majority of the country, own shares. And there's, uh, that's great, right? That's how we build wealth. Uh, maybe not today, where we're talking on a day when the stock markets around the world are not doing particularly well. But generally speaking, that's how we build wealth. But there's more to it than that. Ownership of those shares, every share comes with a vote. So not only are we supposed to uh, enjoy the, the proceeds of the wealth built by those companies, but we should be able to, via those votes, have some say over how companies are run. Every single one of us has more power then we know that we have. The problem is that we don't have a way to use it. And the reason for that is very simple. It's because we have effectively, whether we know it or not, delegated our power to the fund management industry. So if you go back, say, to the uh, 50s, 60s, et cetera, when very few people in the UK were shareholders, maybe 3% of the population were shareholders, the people who had shares, A, they knew they had shares, which an awful lot of people don't at the moment. If you ask people what a pension is, they can't really answer, and they certainly don't necessarily understand that owning or having a pension means that they own shares. But back in the day, people did. They knew, they understood it gave them a stake in a company, and they understood that gave them the right to go to an AGM, to have a say, to vote, to complain, to kick up a fuss, whatever. And of course, get a sandwich, because you've always got a sandwich at AGM. <laughs> um, but now that we are all shareholders, the majority of us are shareholders, we tend to hold our shares via a big fund of some kind. Uh, normally uh, run by one of the one of the big investment management companies in the world, you know, the BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, etc. And what we've done is we've given them our votes, so they're using them. We don't know we have power, and if we did know we have it, we, we don't really use it. We don't know how to use it, and those fund managers are using it for us. Yeah, and tell us a bit about that that industry. If people just are they're handing their money over to a reputable firm, they don't get that much involved or take all that much interest in how it's being managed they're obviously interested primarily in the return who are these sort of giant um, organizations managing people's money i mean the first thing to say about this is this is in many ways this is not a problem at all this is a great thing i mean i have many many complaints about the fund management industry I and mean, they they overcharge their performance is often barely adequate uh, that kind of thing they're horribly overpaid all of them and some of them might not be, but the men at the top are definitely very overpaid. Um, and that's what comes out of, out of our pensions, etc. So but in the main, you know, we wouldn't do this ourselves, the majority of us. We wouldn't run our own money. We can't pick shares. It's much too complicated and difficult. Goodness, look around what's happening today. This is difficult to do. Investing is not easy. So it should be delegated. And in the main, the majority of fund managers do a perfectly adequate job. I wouldn't say brilliant job, but you know, adequate in the main if you give your money to a fund manager in 10 or 15 years you tend to have probably kept up with inflation and you may have a bit more and you'll get dividends so that's all good we're not anti the industry in general mm -hmm. but what happens is that we end up or we have ended up in a position where there are a couple of enormous companies absolutely enormous I mean, blackrock is the biggest fund management company in the world and it's managing something like 10 trillion dollars an enormous amount of money and behind that you've got state street and you've got vanguard and then everyone knows the big names in the uk lng aviva etc if you've got a, a company pension i bet you'll have it with something like you know, aviva lng etc these are all big names and what it means is that power 
inside the global stock market has become very concentrated in their hands. So, you know, BlackRock, for example, will own a stake in pretty much every company in the FTSE 100 and every company in the S&P 500 and any other stock market you can think of. And enough of that company to give them a significant amount of power over yeah. that company has, is run. Now, you may say, that that's OK. Why is that a problem? We can trust these people. We can trust fund managers to do what it is that we want them to do. We've delegated our authority to them in exactly the same way as we delegate our authority to a government when we vote in an election. But it's not really like that because we haven't actually used our votes over any particular issue. And there's a lot going on out there at the moment. And uh, there are an awful lot of things that fund managers are voting on, on our behalf, that we might not necessarily want. Now, every year, here's an example for you. Every year, uh, Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock and possibly the most powerful man in the world, actually, because he controls the biggest asset management company in the world, which controls um, almost controlling stakes because of the way voting works in lots of countries in almost every big company in the world. This is a phenomenally powerful man. And every year, he writes his, his letter, which is ostensibly to the CEOs of the companies in which BlackRock Coal stakes, but it's also to the whole world, so we can see how wonderful Larry Fink is. And in it, he writes about what he expects of companies going forward. And you can read these over the last five or six years. His latest one came out last week. And in them, he lays out expectations of what companies should do. And those are often things that might or might not be debatable. For example, Larry Fink believes very strongly in what we call stakeholder capitalism, which yeah. is where a company does not necessarily uh, respond only to the needs of its shareholders, but has a long list of, of other stakeholders to whom it must be responsible as well. So customers and suppliers and all this kind of thing. Now, you might say, and I would agree, that all these groups are very important. And of course, a company should care about its employee, employees. And of course, a company should care about its suppliers. But a good company cares about these things automatically. Uh -huh. uh, that if you're not nice to your customers, they tend not to be your customers anymore. And if you're not nice to your suppliers, they might supply somebody else, etc. So these things come part and parcel. And there's also a very interesting dynamic at the moment in that we just talked about everyone owning shares. So if you are a shareholder, you're usually a stakeholder as well. So you make things very complicated by saying you owe some kind of uh, 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 responsibility to all these different groups. When one of the reasons that shareholder capitalism, the idea that, that companies should be beholden to one group only and that is their owners, rose in the first place, was because of how difficult it is for a diverse group of owners to control a company. Yes. Yeah. So if you think interrupt me, then I get boring in because it's, it's very easy. Not at all. No, no, it's, fasc it's, it's fascinating. But what just what you were mentioning there in relation to we'll come back to, to Larry Fink in a moment. The theme, a theme that comes across very strongly in, in the book is, is corporate virtue signaling or the, those instructions on how to behave um, yeah. uh, from from Fink to companies. Now, wh where did that come from? Is that, is that really rooted in the aftermath of the financial crisis? Yes, it is. I, mean, I believe it is anyway, but there's, there's lots of different ways of, 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 of finding the beginning of this. But shareholder capitalism is a system that we all used to believe in very strongly. So a definitive article in the New York Times in the 1970s from the economist Milton Friedman uh, made it very clear that this was a correct way for companies to behave for a very simple reason, which is that yes, you have a huge company. I think one of the world's big companies, uh, it doesn't matter what bigger, a big auto company or a, a computer company, whatever it is, it's run by a manager, uh, a CEO, you've got a CFO, you've got a group, a board of directors, group of very important people running this vast company. And the shareholders, there are millions of them. Shareholders are all over the place. So while shareholders may technically own the company, the directors effectively own the company yeah. because they're the ones who make your decisions and have what you might call the rights of ownership. Who decides who's going to use the company private jet? It's not you and it's not me. It's the CEO. Right? Now, if you have something like that, uh, with managerial capitalism, i.e. big companies controlled by managers, you have to have some kind of metric, some kind of way of controlling those managers. And the way of doing that is always to have, as always been historically, to have one metric, metric. We say, this is how we, the shareholders, judge you. And we judge you by how much money you make us and how much you pay at house in dividends over the long run. And our belief that you can continue to do that, not necessarily indefinitely, but for the long run. Now, stakeholder capitalism says that didn't work. Look at the financial crisis. Look at the terrible things that companies have done. That didn't work. So we have to stop 
pull back and say, actually, companies need to be responsible to many, many more organizations, many, many more groups. And then you have the, the rise of, of, of a huge number of, of pressure groups um, made up of uh, institutional investors, non-institutional investors, ordinary people, et cetera, pushing down on the companies, telling them you must do this, you must be responsible to that group, you must be responsible to this group. And then you have the big fund managers with this huge voting power mm. saying to, them, to make us look good, we want you to do this. Um, well, that's rather how it feels anyway. And uh, then you have um, what's become known as ESG investing, environmental, social and governance investing, where you invest, where you draw money in based on the idea that you will then encourage the companies to behave in certain ways. And that's been a phenomenally attractive marketing uh, method for the big fund managers over the last couple of years. So that draws the money in and then you put the pressure on the companies. So it's, it, what you're describing is really, it's like a pendulum effect then, isn't it? That it, it's the, now this is a, a crude characterization of the of the Friedman view, but that ultimately they have one responsibility and the only responsibility is to make returns for their, for their shareholders uh, and investors. And that swung in the other direction too. They, they have, um, all manner of obligations which are too complex to explain so that the shareholders ultimately don't really count in the way that they yeah. used to. Your, <laughs> your, your, your book is really is, is about restoring some kind of balance because you require both. I mean, there's no company without a, without a return ultimately at the end of the day. And also good companies have always been aware of their obligations. Absolutely. And you can ask too much of companies as well. I mean, remember, running running a company is not easy. Running a company in a series of rolling pandemics and at a time when wages are rising very fast and globalization is being rolled back and supply chains are difficult. It's not an easy thing to do. So to ask someone to do that and concentrate on all these um, other issues around the edge is extremely difficult. But the, the point of the book is, is not necessarily this. It's not necessarily what a company should or shouldn't do. Mm. It's about who should tell a company what they should or shouldn't do. And my main point is that the person who should sell, tell a company what to do or what not to do is not Larry Fink, is not Jamie Dimon, is not any of these uh, uh, huge well-off fund managers. It's us because we actually own the shares. We actually own the companies. Now, these big fund managers, they control them because we have effectively, as I say, unknowingly delegated our votes to them. But it's not, shouldn't be about what they want. It should be about what we want. Yeah. And now, until quite recently, they haven't had the ability to ask us what we want, right? They could do it by polls or surveys or whatever. But since we started this business of delegating all investment into funds of various sorts, so they're accumulated and invested as a group, you know, the technology hasn't really existed to ask people how they would like to vote within that. It's very complicated. You know, some people own a tiny bit of a fund, some people own a vast bit of a fund. How do you give people their look through rights to be able to vote? Now, you can do that now. It's really very simple, but it wasn't even a decade ago. We'll come back to that in a moment, but there's, there's a really, there's a, fantastic passage in the book where you where you quote Jamie Dimon who of course the CEO of JP Morgan Chase one of the veterans of the crisis reinvented himself uh, a, you know a, a phenomenon at Wall Street uh, you know one of the Wall Street uh, big hitters and you quote his 66 page long letter to shareholders on the thoughts and purposes purpose of companies and US public um, policy. This man doesn't just think he knows how to run a bank. He's got a total grip on how everyone else should deal with poverty, climate change, economic development, and even racial inequality. Uh, and then you quote from the letter and you say, yikes, it's a full manifesto for a more progressive style of capitalism. One I am filing away in a very large file called Man Who Has Made Vast Fortune Calls for Other People Not to Be Allowed to Make Vast Fortunes. You detected though in the, in the, in the Fink letter, you think things are changing a bit there. Oh, well, not necessarily. Um, Larry Fink has written a slightly different letter this year in that um, having spent the last last couple of years going on and on and on about various ESG issues and about how companies should not just be focused on uh, making a good product, uh, selling it politely to customers, um, taking the product back if it doesn't work properly, et cetera, making money and um, then passing those profits on to shareholders. The last few years have been all about how they should take a, a, a social role in their communities and yeah. be much more than that, that every company has to be much more than just a company. It has to have a, a driving purpose uh, beyond that, which was sort of summed up rather wonderfully in a a letter from Terry Smith, the founder of Fundsmith recently, when he was pointing out the difficulties in this approach with Unilever and saying that, you know, if you think mayonnaise needs a purpose, um, then you haven't really been focusing because it already has one, which is to make sandwiches taste better. And 
things. Um, now, there's been the beginning of criticism, and my book is not the only one on this. There's a wonderful book that, that's worth reading called you know, Woke about uh, this idea that capitalism as a whole has become woke and that just doesn't work. So this year's letter from Larry Fink is, is a desperate attempt, or it feels slightly desperate anyway, to explain that it's not woke, that stakeholder capitalism is not a woke idea and um, being, uh, uh, being more socially responsible as a company is, is not something that that makes yeah. capitalism particularly difficult to shareholder capitalism sometimes make them sound kind of like the same thing which in a way is what i am trying to say is that you if you are a good shareholder capitalist you are almost by default a good stakeholder capitalist and then yeah. interestingly towards the end of his letter uh, larry fink and i really move on to the same page this is something i really never thought would happen which is towards <laughs> the end of his letter he starts talking about how important it is for his clients to have a say over how their votes are used could this catch on i mean it really is <laughs> <I'm the laughs> a crazy idea at the moment, he's just talking about his institutional clients being allowed, yeah. allowed to vote. So we're passing the votes around from fund manager to fund manager to fund manager. But there is a hint in there where he says, you know, one day at some point, he would like, you know, even individuals, even the little people, even you know, even <laughs> you and me and the little people, he says, he'd like them eventually one day to be able to use their own votes. So you know, there are hints of progress out there. Sweet. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask you, yeah, there are. I was just going to say that there are some signs of progress. That's it. But it, so, if there is this this um, you know this sh this shortcoming in the system that essentially you know share power is not being exercised, what what's the way forward? I mean, you've you've got six practical suggestions in the book. For for you know, the first one is let us um, use our votes. What can be done? Well, actually, I mean, there is there is a lot of movement. I mean, there is certainly among, you know, we don't all own our shares just, by, just via the funds. A lot of us own them on platforms. And again, we don't own them directly because even if we think we own an individual share, it's still held on the platform. So they do have the rights and you have to ask in the name for those rights. But some of the platforms and uh, um, II is very good at this, for example, they now have you opt out rather than opt in of taking your own voting rights, etc. So the platforms, the investing platforms are beginning to get it for people who have individual shares. And so much easier to get hold of your rights there. And the fund managers, you know, there are now a couple of brilliant companies, uh, Tumor is an excellent one, that is beginning to work with the fund managers to give them the systems to ask us what we want and then persuade them to try and take that into account. It's not yeah. quite what I want yet. It's not a direct look through kind of voting, but it's beginning to say, you are the end owners. What is it that you want? And there's lots of discussion about this in the US as well. So it is coming. Yeah. Now, just to prove that this is that reaction is boutique um, media and that we're small, I've just got to go and let the cat out who has just decided to join the broadcast. I wanted to but, and we, so we're talking about share power. We're talking about how ordinary people can change the way that capitalism works and makes and make money, too. So I'm going to let the cat out and I'm going to come right back. So you don't get that with the BBC or Sky yeah. News. And then so, you, so there's that, that sense of there is more information that can be provided. But then also, I mean, I like the, you know, the idea of you talked about make listing easier. Yeah. I Talk mean, us it, through that. Listing can be difficult and tiring. And, uh, you know, there are, there are, there have been several interesting things that have happened during the pandemic. One is the big rise of the retail investor, which is one of the reasons why this book matters right now and why it's worth writing right now, because there has been this huge rise in the in the in ordinary people coming to the market, starting yeah. to play around in, in, in the stock market. But the other thing that's happened is that we're beginning to see more and more companies coming back to the market to list. And we also saw at the very beginning of the pandemic, companies start to understand, start to see how amazing it is to have a group of willing shareholders who will give you more money when you need it just like that you can go to market and ask more money and if you're a good company with a good future they will give it to you now yep. that's important because we've been seeing over the last couple of decades a gradual shrinking of the number of companies listed on public markets uh, partly because it's right it's it's difficult to list there's lots of uh, transparency obligations you have to write end of reports you have to you know the, fit in with all kinds of regulations now being a private company isn't necessarily uh, regulation free but it's an awful lot easier and it's also been easier over the last decade with very very low interest rates easy money the rise of private equity it's been easy to raise money off the public markets as well. So it's really important 
that if we want to have a shareholder democracy of the kind that I think really makes capitalism work, it's really important that we encourage companies to list and that we encourage people to be engaged shareholders. Both of these things are vital. And there are various ways that we can make uh, listing just more straightforward. Uh, than yeah. Where does AIM fit into all of this? Um, in terms of... Just what, I mean, where, where does it go? I mean, one of our subscribers just said, make sure you ask um, Merrin, who'd read my weekend letter said, make sure you ask, you know, what, he, he's a great evangelist for, yeah. for, for AIM and for the benefits of it, which maybe you can, you should explain to, to our Well, to AIM, our AIM is, AIM is a, 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 an exchange that is just slightly easier to list on for smaller companies. So the regulatory, regulatory uh, rules are, are slightly lower. And I think that's great. You know, I'm, I'm very pro AIM. I'm very pro anything that makes it easier. But, you know, we need to make it easier on the big exchanges as well. You know, there are lots of companies that sit on AIM and just stay there. But as you become a, a larger company and you want a larger audience and you want to be you know, more globally recognized, et cetera, you need to be in the, in the other indices uh, and yeah. those can be easier as well but it's not, it's not just about the companies it's about the shareholders as well we need to engage them more not just via what i was talking about just now in terms of giving them information and allowing them to to uh, offer their ideas but you know in the in the old days in the old days people had a much more direct relationship with the companies that they held shares in agms shareholder yeah. perks you know you knew that you owned a company you understood that you owned it and you understood that by owning it you were part of the economy and that's, I think, the thing that, that really matters and that we're missing at the moment. Did, did people stay in for longer then? That, that they had this idea that they, they were a shareholder of Marks and Spencers that maybe inherited some of the shares. I know it was a much smaller number of people who actually who were active in them in the market, but that there was a there was a personal pride in connection with the company. Absolutely. You'd inherit them. You'd hold them for a long time. You'd use your shareholder perks, you know, your discount at Marks and Spencers, uh, your discount on your cruises, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and so that relationship existed much more. I'm not sure we can really get that relationship back, given the number of shareholders that we have at the moment. Which is and, the, just, and the sheer and the volume, just the, the sort of scale of the market. But you exactly. do, you do, there's an interesting proposal where you talk about essentially making directors care and saying shouldn't uh, a, a non-executive director be identified as responsible for engagement with uh, uh, end beneficiaries. That's you know, yeah, us. Because this is one of the things that companies uh, regularly forget uh, in the same way that fund managers do, actually. It's very, if you talk to a, uh, an institutional fund manager about who his end beneficiary is, he very often has to think for a couple of minutes before he remembers that it's us. You know, that it's us, that we're the clients, we're the end owners, not him. And it's the same with companies. You know, they're working to please the institutional investor and they're forgetting uh, that what is really required is, is our pensions, our retirements, our dividends, our incomes. You know, they're, they're there. What they're doing is, is to you know, improve the economy, to build profits, et cetera, to build great businesses, we hope. But the end game is building wealth for its end investors, which is us. Now, so where are we, do you think, in terms of the, the broader economic backdrop for investors? This, this inflation, which was supposed to be temporary, transitory, whatever, um, doesn't seem to be, and it's, it's sticking around. You, how worried are you? Um, very, but uh, you know we've been we've been worried for a while. I mean, I don't think you can ever print money on this in this kind of uh, volume and expect to get away with it long term. And we're beginning to see the consequences of that. Um, you know, we obviously have supply problems as a result of the pandemic, and those supply problems are going to continue for some time. Particularly if China is going to continue a zero COVID policy. You know, there's no way that global supply can be completely easy if you're on a series of rolling lockdowns across Asia. It just doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. So the supply problems will last longer than people think. But also, we have created a massive wave of demand, a massive wave of demand in all sorts of areas that is way higher than it was pre-pandemic by putting money directly into people's pockets, uh, a new kind of QE. We've effectively had people's QE for the last couple of years, right? And people have built, built wealth from that. They have cushions. And as they begin to spend it, if you've got supply vaguely constrained and you've got demand higher than it was pre-pandemic, what is it that you expect? Uh, inflation, of course you get inflation. Add to that the way the labour market has changed, uh, not just in the UK, by the way, but everywhere. You've got the great retirement, the great resignation, whatever you like to call it. A lot of people leaving the labour market, a huge number of vacancies. And you're beginning to see the beginning of what you might think would be a wage price spiral, where people are definitely asking for more money and will definitely get it because employers don't have a choice. And that will roll through into more inflation over the next couple of years. And that, of course, yeah. automatically either hits corporate margins or leads to more inflation. 
presumably, I mean, that that labor shortage that you described, that doesn't seem to be temporary. And it seems to be, you know, across the developed economies. That's presumably going to drive business investment, isn't it? It's going to drive autom automation as companies try and adjust. It should do. And for really lucky, it'll give us the great um, productivity boom we've been waiting for for years and years and years. But of course, what, one thing to watch, particularly today, by the way, is that um, one argument for why labor has been disappearing in the US in particular is because, uh, you know, post the financial crisis, when the markets were not in great shape, the American economy or American individuals uh, looking forward to retirement rely very much on the level of the stock market or the level of house prices, right? So as they fall, as they did um, post financial crisis, people think, well, maybe I'll just stay in the labor market a little longer, right? Mm -hmm. um, but now we've had this wonderful bull market, equity prices have been incredibly high, house prices very high. So during the pandemic, you know, you might think to yourself, well, actually, this isn't a bad time just to pull out. You know, stock market falls another sort of like, maybe if it falls 30% from here, let's say Jeremy Grantham, who thinks we've had a super bubble and now we're going to have a super super crash. If that actually happens, maybe our labor crisis will go away. What do you think happens to something like property? In, okay. in what context? In well, context, it's just it, you take take to take residential property, okay. not just the U, not just the UK, but it, at the start of the crisis, pretty much every economist predicted some kind of uh, property crash or or correction, yeah. and there's been there's been a boom for reasons we understand. Yeah. Stamp, you know, the stamp duty incentive, shortage of supply, particularly now. Does it just keep going? Uh, I, I've been so wrong on property. Um, because I look at it and I say, well, that's just too expensive. This is not sustainable. Um, and then it just keeps going. It just keeps going. So the only way it stops going is if interest rates do turn around fairly dramatically. But of course, in the UK, at least so many uh, rates are now fixed. You know, so in, in the immediate, if interest rates go up, people don't get hurt yeah. very much. It's only when they come to remortgage and when people come to buy, etc. So, um, you know, I, the answer is I just don't know. On every normal level, you look at it and you say this has to revert to the mean, has to revert to the mean, so this can't go on, um, but it does just keep going on. Back to the main question of the book then, yeah. share power. Ultimately, you're pretty optimistic really about all this. I'm really optimistic. I really am optimistic. You know, there's a big view out there all the time that there's something horribly wrong with capitalism, that it's some, some kind of disaster and that we need some kind of new system. But, you know, look around us. It's obviously not true. Obviously not true. You only have to look at the way um, companies adapted during the pandemic, how extraordinary it was, you know, shortage of blue paper for what, two weeks. And then after that, you know, really nothing. Uh, our, our companies adapted in the most extraordinary way. Capitalism is a system that works with the way people are. You know, we're natural barterers, we're natural accumulators, it works with human nature rather than against it. And when people talk about, you know, we need a more socialist structure, we need some kind of common ownership, etc. Well, we know from our experience, you know, we're getting old now. And, you know, we, we can look back and we can see that this doesn't work. Every attempt to create common ownership in that way is always a disaster. But what you have with a shareholder democracy is a different kind of common ownership. You know, socialism might promise everyone ownership. Shareholder democracy actually delivers everyone a tiny bit of ownership, a stake in an economy and an, an ability to grow wealth as a result. And that's an extraordinary thing. Yeah. In fact, actually, you, you deal with socialism in, uh, in, in two sentences right at the beginning of the book. Now have, uh, just to quote you, there have been many experiments with socialism over the last 100 years. To date, every one of them has ended in poverty and pain, which is a pretty good way of doing it. Marion Somerset Webb, thank you very much for joining us. We've been talking about share power on reaction if you're not a subscriber to reaction on youtube just hit the subscribe button below also visit the site and you become a member of reaction you can get my weekly newsletter on politics and economics and culture and much more besides you get maggie pagano writing on the site you get tim marshall every week on geopolitics and also if you become a new annual member for the next few weeks we also um we're we're sending you as as a welcome gift this rather brilliant new book by Merrin Somerset Webb. Merrin Somerset Webb, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.